So the recording has uh, started. Um, I have a couple of small, uh, short announcements to make before we uh, have Kalea present on the flavors, BC flavors. Um, one, we are bound by the Linux Foundation antitrust policy. So that, that's one of the requirements that uh, all of the attendees have to agree to that. The second one is uh, the code of conduct from the Linux Foundation, which says that essentially that you have to be, uh, you know, when, when you, uh, even when you disagree with people, you cannot be disagreeable. That is the first thing. Second is permit everyone to talk um, and uh, no rudeness, which is pretty uh, straightforward. Um, anyway, so I think we have about 10 people right now and uh, Kalia is going to present um, on uh, very fabulous credential flavors, which is the various ways in which it can be presented um, and held and issued and so on. The, um, uh, everyone knows Kalia, that is what I've learned. Uh, and she's quickly becoming a legend. And without any further hesitation, I'm handing it out over to Kalia to uh, begin the presentation. Unmute. Thanks, Vipin. Um, good morning, everyone, or evening, depending on where you are in the world. Um, so <clears throat> this is, uh, I'll, I'm going to share a slide presentation version of the paper that was published last week by the COVID Credentials Initiative on our Linux Foundation Public Health. But before um, I, I just wanted to set some context, um, which is that um, I'm the ecosystems director and I work on COVID Credentials Initiative part-time along with Lucy and John. Uh, we were founded last April, and there are over 400 participants from around the world <clears throat> who are looking at standardizing, productizing VCs, and really focusing on addressing COVID use cases. Um, and we joined Linux Foundation Public Health in December 2020. Um, this is a really good match for us because Linux Foundation Public Health has been working on open source software with public health authorities and specifically the um, proximity detection applications. They host code bases for several applications that have millions of users around the world. Um, at, at CCI, we're, we have three different work, three different groups doing work right now, use cases, implementation work stream, go, go, rules and governance, and the vaccine credentials focus group and we're very keen on both open standards and open source development. <clears throat> this is more details about the specifics of our work stream and work products that we've already um, developed. And then um, in terms of open standards, that's one of the places that I've been really active in for you know, decades, um, but really focused here on seeing how we can align the standards around verifiable credentials and the exchange protocols. And we are also exploring um, the opportunities to take in different um, code bases and sort of provide core open source tools to enable the vision that we're articulating. And if you want to get involved in our community, um, these are all the places you can do so. And these slides will be shared after on, um, we'll put a link to them in the, the show notes basically, and, and I'll post them on SlideShare. So this is the, 
this is getting to the the main main agenda item, which is this paper. Um, I was I've been paying attention to these differences in verifiable credentials um, for quite a while, and was noticing that some were dismissing the real technical differences as instead of understanding them as substantive and meaningful, we're dismissing them as tribal and petty. So the, the purpose of this paper was to really get clear these different technical choices underlying different flavors of verifiable credentials. So at its heart of verifiable, the verifiable credential standard is a data model. It's a universal data format that lets any entity express anything about another entity and provides a common mechanism for for um, understanding that they're cryptographically secure tamper evidence. And if you do it right, they can also be privacy respecting and they're all machine readable. So this is the core architecture that we're talking about. And within this, this is what we'll be going into detail on. There is a JSON LD family of data presentation along with LD signatures or with a new emerging signature format uh, with BBS signatures that enables zero knowledge proof. There's JSON, which is um, can be signed with JSON web tokens. And then there's the ZKP Kamenesh Laskaya signatures or ZKPCL. This um, just since this is a hyperledger uh, focused group, this last um, ZKPCL is the type of signatures um, and data that is um, was is sort of the predominant form in Aries. Although there's new work bringing in the JSON LD BBS plus work. So this is a verifiable credential. And um, there are two data formats and the signing mechanisms for claims that are articulated in the specification. So this is JSON, uh, it's JavaScript object notation and it's an open standard for object and document format that's usable for interchange and it's human readable. And it consists of attribute value pairs. And you can see a real world example of JSON on the right um, and examples of the different types of uh, values um, that are acceptable within this format. So there's numbers, there's strings. So the first name John is a string. There is Boolean values of true or false. There's also, you can leave, um, leave fields empty and they are null. And you can have an array, which is an ordered list of zero or more values, which may be of any type. So in this example, you see an array of different types of phone numbers, a home phone number and an office phone number. Uh, JWT claim is sort of leveraging um, this uh, suite of signing um, capabilities and the current um, way that you find out what the meaning of the different terms are in JSON is looking them up in the IANA registry for different, um, the meaning of things like name and phone number. And <clears throat> so there is this one registry and if the terms you wanna use are not in the registry, you can use them, but it's really ambiguous what the meaning is. And when I've talked to large technology companies who implement this form and, and, and say, hey, how do you find out the meaning? They're like, well, I guess they guess. Okay, so next we have, and then this is what um, it looks like when you sort of a very high level zoomed out graphic version of a verifiable credential in JSON. There's a persistent decentralized identifier for it. It has a set of name value pairs and those are signed using JWT using the private key of the issuer associated with the public key in the DID document for that issuer. 
Next, we have JSON LD, which is JavaScript object notation linked data. So JSON LD supports an additional layer of context to map the name part of the name value pair into an RDF ontology. So what is an RDF ontology? It's basically a way that um, to find out the meaning of particular terms, a large repository of RDF ontologies is found at schema.org. And this happens to be following the schema.org contact uh, type of, of on type for movie. So if, if you go and you look it up in schema.org, you can see what name director uh, genre and trailer actually mean. So you can do disambiguation when you're looking at two different credentials from two different sources and trying to understand whether they mean the same thing or not. And if they're both pointing at the same RDF ontology, they do mean the same thing. And if they're pointing at different ones, they may or may not, but you can do the, the machine parsing to figure it out. Additional features um, that JSON LD introduces on top of uh, JSON is a universal identifier mechanism for JSON objects via the use of IRIs, way to disambiguate keys shared among different JSON documents by mapping IRIs in context. You're able to, um, this is really, really valuable, annotate strings within other languages. So for example, a real world example is the DIVOC um, code base that India has developed to roll out its vaccine is using JSON LD because they have 22 official languages. Actually, the total number of languages in India is over 700, but there's 22 official languages so they can have the schema for the credential and translate it into all those languages and be able to present it to folks. Um, there's a way to associate data types with values such as dates and times and a facility to express one or more directed graphs such as a social network and a signal document. So JSON LD also canonicalizes the attribute value pairs in a predictable way based on the information model being processed. So based on the RDF. So this is what it looks like on a high level simplified graphic version. You have a persistent decentralized identifier that the credential is anchored to. The context points outside of itself to a URL where the RDF can be looked up and it's signed using linked data signatures with the private key of the issuer associated with the public key in the did document of the issuer. So neither of these formats easily support selective disclosure and ZKPs, but both claim they can. Um, if an issuer puts an attribute into its own separate VC, this is possible. So I could get a verifiable credential from say, if this ever happened, the state of California that was associated with my driver's license, but instead of putting my birth date on it, they just say, um, over 21 in the, in the separate VC that I could use just to, to sort of hack um, selective disclosure by having credentials that already are sort of pre-prepared to address various needs. Um, it's not possible for a holder to separate different verifiable credential claims when they're all bundled together in one VC. And both JSON JWT credentials and JSON LD LD signature credentials require that the holder show the whole credential with verifiers. There's no partial share or show. And this makes it much harder to support selective disclosure. So um, this is a quote from one of the community members, Ori Steele. Um, JWT is part of the Jose family framework and provides no means to support semantic disambiguation but has the benefit of being simpler for assertion format implementation. So Zay is the rice and beans of cryptography standards. It's got everything you need to survive and it's easy to make, but its extensibility model guarantees you will be eating rice, base64 URLs, 
and beans, JSON forever. That might make you fat because base64 URL inflates JSON. On the other hand, like data proofs as seen in verifiable credentials and verifiable presentations are like the pharmaceutical drug. Really hard to build, but capable of solving all kinds of problems that formally described by an information theoretic model where that molecular formula approximates RDF. Linked data proofs are capable of working with other bases, other structured data formats, and an extensibility model is anything that you can model in RDF. Context determines the relevance of either model. Most people don't go to a pharmaceutical lab to make lunch, but most people who make drugs in their kitchen eventually end up sick. So now we get to the presentation side of things. Um, so this is, uh, again, this high level graphical attempt I have at sort of encapsulating what's true for both JSON and JSON-LD is that you're sending the assigned version of the, ho the whole verifiable credential to the verifier. And it, and it contains a nonce that's from the verifier so that the presentation of that credential can't be replayed. So this is a strong security feature, um, but you can't selectively disclose. So now let's move on to the understanding ZKPCL. So schemas are defined in a document that's written to an indie ledger so that they can't be changed. And to update the schema, a new version must be created and written to the ledger for future use. And um, so this is, I kind of want to, let me go. So this, you can see the schema definition is here being posted to, to the ledger. The other thing that's different about these um, credentials is that they're anchored to a link secret known only to the holder and stored in the holder software. Um, and this has been described to me as somewhat of a like a watermark. So it's really specific to the holder and it um, is like a number hidden within a number that you can prove that the whole that all of the credentials in a particular holder's wallet were issued to the same person and using that same wallet. Um, and this is a positive thing um, in terms of, you know, a difference is that the ZKP methods don't use persistent DIDs to anchor the credentials to. It creates a privacy problem when you share your credentials if they're all linked to the same identifier. So this is, uh, and each of the each of the messages in the credential has its own separate signature, and it's through this mechanism that when you get to the verifiable presentation, that the holder can choose to share some of those statements and not all of them, and the verifier can still do the calculations they need to get the proof that the statements haven't been altered and that they indeed came from the issuer. So, uh, hey, Kalia, thanks. So I get with the CL signature that you could determine the uh, uh, authenticity of it, but how do you tell if they're manipulated? There's usually a, a hash or some sort of checksum or something. So how, how do you determine, as you just said, that they weren't manipulated? Um, how do you determine? In other I words, mean, if your name is signed, you can look at the signature to see that it's authentic, that, you know, they, yeah. is, right. I think you're going to have to ask him more Aries per specific okay. All right. person this question. I no am problem. doing my best to provide technically no, accurate yet simplified information. No, you're doing it. Ravi, I just, I, yeah. It, it, Ra Ravi, like can it. you answer that question? Is Ravi around? 
No. Oh, there. Okay. But this is this is uh, public key signatures. It's um, so so. There's public and private keys, and when you make a credential, you actually uh, when you make a credential definition, you write to the ledger. Uh, public keys uh, corresponding to each one of those fields and you keep private keys in your wallet. Then you, when you issue a credential, you are issuing a credential using your private keys for that particular item within your credential. And, uh, and so it is unique to the item and to your public key that you published on the ledger. So you can verify the uh, the origin because you go out to ledger and you get that public key for that particular item and you authenticate the data that it's uh, un unadulterated at the same time. But it's, yeah, anyways, it's, it's signed by the issuer's keys, right? It's, it's kind of a, uh, um, a sub key system. So when you write, that's the whole purpose of the credential mm -hmm. definition Do you write to the indie ledger is that you are writing in that credential definition, you're writing sub keys for each one of those fields that are, that are public private key pairs. That, does that explain it okay? I don't know if that's true, but I'll go with it. I, I didn't understand that every single field in a indie, in a, in a ZKPCL has a separate set of keys to sign it. Yeah, it's it's a it's a sub key, but yes, it does. You can look on the ledger, you can see them. Wow. Okay, so this is why people say this is really heavy. Um. Okay, and then there is a new emerging. Um, it's now, I guess it's get, getting to be almost a year old that this was put forward into the community, which is sort of combining the best of JSON LD with the opportunity to provide um, selective disclosure. And so they leverage JSON LD. So the meaning of the fields can be looked up in the same way that you do with JSON LD. <coughs> um, and then each of the statements is signed separately um, with the issuer private key associated with the public keys in their DID document. And you can either use the same mechanism that has been innovated for the ZKPCL to do a link secret or an alternative way, which is BLS SIG, which is um, less cryptographically heavy and is based on more widely spread cryptographic tooling. And then this is the, the sort of my high level um, articulation of the verifiable presentation where the, um, the holder can decide which ones of the statements they want to share with the verifier and the verifier does their checks um, to check the veracity um, in this, you know, in the same way. So I feel like I missed a slide. Uh, I'm going to go back. Ah, we didn't miss a slide. So this um, JSON LD ZKP with BBS Plus is based on the usage of JSON, these signatures and a sub, which is a sub JSON, BBS Plus JSON LD signature is a subclass of LD signatures and it's used in common with combination with a JSON LD credential schema. Um, it is a multi-messenger signature scheme. So that's where each of the statements is signed separately. And you can, because of this, you can break up the um, claims into their fundamental attributes. Um, and the benefit of this approach is that it provides interoperability with existing schema technologies and credentials using JSON LD and by extension, and is fully compliant with the verifiable, verifiable credential specification as it exists today. 
um, by leveraging the technology of JSON LD with a specific set of cryptographic keys types and algorithms, the mechanism is able to produce a VC that can generate a proof of presentations and ZKBs that selectively disclose attributes of a credential. So with that, um, that is all of the slides I have and um, we can open it up for questions and discussion. Can, can you give examples? Uh, I, I'm of course familiar with the Hyperledger Indie. Can you give examples of where the other uh, flavors are being used? What blockchains? So the blockchain is the least important part about verifiable credentials. Right, okay. Well, they become very important in Indy because you have to go get the schemas, right? right. Um, so let's just say like where, who, what other folks are using. So the JSON LD, um, the JSON LD um, work is being used a lot and um, in supply chain stuff because uh, steel and pallets of microwaves don't need privacy. <laughs> um, and so that's, um, and, and so the Silicon Valley Innovation Program has been really focused on Jason LD. Um, so companies engaged there are using it. Um, the JSON JWT is being um, is sort of Microsoft's go-to, um, and Workday has also adopted it. Um, so, yeah. Thanks. Oh, and consensus. I have a question, Carolyn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is Luca Valdez. Um, well, thank you for the presentation. Um, yes, yeah, um, we know that the verifiable credential schema is quite general indeed, and it allows many different options, at least theoretically, the model is quite open. And for instance, it allows for the subject to be distinct from the holder, which is the most typical case indeed. In the normal case, we are thinking of the holder of a verifiable credential being the subject as well of the credential. Yeah. So that he, he is able to prove that uh, uh, he has proof of possession of the credential. Uh, nevertheless, the, the, the specification, as far as I understand, are more open than that. And they allow uh, for different models where the holder is not the subject. Uh, the mm -hmm. point is, I'm not aware, in, in fact, of any implementation in the present state-of-the-art uh, dealing with subjects different from the holder. Do you, do you know of some of this implementation? Can you point to some examples? Since that might be relevant for some use cases we're considering. Yeah, well, uh, the subject of a credential about steel imports is the steel. Yeah. Okay, so, so, so all uh, of those use cases that are around things are that. Uh, and the implementation supporting these concepts. Yeah. Okay. This is the, the one which I know from more, more closely, namely Hyperledger and Arias. Uh, mm -hmm. I have the impression they do not support this model. Oh, they must, I mean, there's a whole guardianship working group out of um, Sovereign and they've been working on this type of use case for, since the very beginning. Okay, so that, that should be possible. Okay, yes. thank you. Thank you. So delegation and guardianship uh, have been worked on like uh, Kalia says from inception. And I, uh, you know, as far as uh, implementations go, we, we have to defer to the uh, people who know more about that. Yeah, and if Kalia says there are, we assume there are. Oh, for sure. <laughs> uh, the, um, you know, we, we probably could uh, question the identity working group implementers, you know, identity implementers working group, which is 
kind of a sister group of this group uh, whether such implementations exist because you are obviously interested in actual implementations because you're working on some kind of a delegation or guardianship uh, uh, use case. Yes, that's exactly the point. Thank you. Um, Ruben, anything more to add on this? Because you mentioned that you use WTs or anybody uh, else for that matter? No, I, I just, I think maybe we, when we started, we, um, I thought the maturity of the tooling wasn't quite there yet. So we used JDOT at the beginning, but we are now also uh, going to add support for JSON ID because we believe that JSON ID with PBS Plus seems to be a really good uh, compromise to achieve um, a lot of the interoperability plus the security uh, the privacy aspect. So I think that's our direction. Um, and BBS Plus work was done in Orsa, which is also a major project. It started off as a lab, but now it's a full fledged project. I think Mike Loder worked on it. Uh, he has a pretty uh, sensitive explanation of uh, BBS Plus uh, on the Matter website if anybody is interested. Uh, not too much mathematics. <laughs> anyway. Uh, yeah, and I think uh, just to add on the previous point, there is an, an interesting uh, white paper developed by IOTA and uh, how are they seeing IoT devices using self-sovereign identity. Let me post that white paper link in the chat box uh, in case if that sounds interesting for some. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I'll put the link to the paper in the um, chat. This is really, um, this was a very, I, I went by faster than I, this is my first presentation about it. So it went by faster than I thought, um, but you definitely need to read the paper if you wanna actually understand all the things I said. Yeah, uh, the the paper link is also I think provided in the wiki page, and probably we'll have this um, the slides also on the wiki page of our wiki page. In addition to the um, to the recording of the video, um, which should give more uh, exposure to different people on the, this particular topic. Um, I am more interested in this because of the interoperability implications, uh, especially in, the, um, in other space, like for example, let us say you're doing financial transactions uh, and how can you create interoperability in that situation using uh, identity as a pivot. And uh, so I, you know, maybe I'll be looking more into that. Uh, and I think the CCI work is very interesting. We started off our year last year in April with uh, uh, basically uh, explanation of the uh, Apple and Google schemes to do uh, um, exposure uh, track uh, tracing. Uh, and uh, now that we have come to this, to the other side of things where we are, we have a vaccine. And I think uh, Kalia, you, you had a pretty uh, extensive um, sort of presentation on it, two days worth, I think, uh, at uh, WHO, right? Is, isn't that correct? 
Okay, you just went from like gain APIs to WHO. I'm very confused. What are you asking? I'm not asking. Uh, I'm basically trying to uh, say that you had several um, observations on this uh, CCI initiative, and this paper is developed as part of that. That's that's all I was saying. Uh, anyway, I think uh, we have come to the end of this presentation. And so unless somebody else has uh, questions, we can close the presentation or ask. It went, it went fast, sorry. It's okay, uh, you know, we, we learned something. Um, unless anyone else or Kalia herself has uh, some things to say about this uh, topic. Um, so see you next time. Next time it's going to be Drummond talking about his new book, uh, SSI uh, book that he's written. So that's uh, two weeks from now at noon. Thank you for attending. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.